Welcome to the Holy Post. The death of Queen Elizabeth has some wondering about the future of Christianity in the UK. Will King Charles continue to be the defender of the faith? We all know evangelicals are divided by politics, but a new report says Catholics are as well. Can we actually learn from one another in these divided times? Then a new report says that poverty in the US among children has declined dramatically. But what's the reason? Then I talked to Anglican pastor Aaron Damiani about his journey from megachurch burnout to life-giving liturgy and his new book, Earth Filled with Heaven. All of that, plus why you should never drink coffee before shopping or trust an advertisement featuring a dog. Here is episode 528. Hey there, welcome back to the Holy Post Podcast. I'm Phil Vischer. I am here with Christian Taylor. Hi, Christian. Hi there. And also Sky Jatani. Hi, Sky. Hi, Phil. How is your how's your polar beehive doing? I <laughs> a polar beehive. That's, that's what funny. it looks like you're in. You call you yeah. say I'm in the Death Star. You're in a polar yeah, beehive. I'm in a polar beehive. It's it's chilly but sweet. <laughs> and we all do little dances here to communicate with one another. The best way. How's the Death Star sky? It's fantastic. Good. And how's uh, uh, James's giant peach, Christian? <laughs> Cozy and orange. That's fantastic. Okay. And how are all of you out there, listeners? Are you in colorful spaces, colorful and or geometric and or pop culture referenced spaces? I hope so. So, you know, send us letters. Tell us where you are. Send us pictures so we can picture all of you, all of you sitting where you're sitting, listening to the show. And now it's time for the theme song. What's the news that you like the most? Who's your favorite podcast host? If it's breakfast, get your toast. It's Sky and Phil and the Holy Post. Sky and Phil and the Holy Post. And sometimes Christian. Oh my goodness, you've asked for it now, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> what could your possibly in- go wrong? Right. <laughs> your <laughs> inbox flooded with people's... No, I didn't give out my email. I just said send email. They just send, send it to holypost.com. Send it, yeah. yeah. Go to holypost.com. Show us where you like to listen to the podcast. Okay. What are you eating, Sky? Peanuts. Okay. Did you have lunch? Is this your lunch? Yeah, not really. I just now had a we're going to get of... comments from the peanut gallery. Yeah. Who's? Hey, you're eating my relatives. Stop it. I just had some chocolate-covered peanuts. Those are like peanuts, but made more American. Even though pe- did peanuts peanuts originate in America? Are they just a, a new world thing, or were are, were there peanuts in the old world? Anyone? Let's find out. Okay, somebody find out. Where's Jason? Oh, well, he's gone. Somebody Google the origin of peanuts because I need to know. I have, uh, while well, he looks that up, I have two stories, two short stories of research that I think I, I already are found it, Bill. Yeah, what is it? What's up? The peanut, while grown in tropical and subtropical regions throughout the world, is native to the Western Hemisphere. It probably originated in South America. Oh, South hmm. America. There you go. Oh. Then it traveled to Georgia. And then it, and then or it Jimmy went over, Carter found it and made and it into it, an industry. And it went over to Thailand so they could make peanut sauce. <laughs> They oh, must this would be peanuts. a great animatic following the spreading of yeah, the Yeah, the spread of the peanut, the invasive species we all like to call the peanut, which of course is not a nut, it's a legume. So there you go. Dog owners take more risks. Cat owners are more cautious. New research examines how people conform to their pet's stereotypical traits. So the question <laughs> is, are the people conforming to the pets or are the pets conforming to the people? But here's the conclusions of this research. Dog owners tend to take bigger risks and respond more to reward-oriented advertisements. Cat owners, on the other hand, are more cautious and more likely to respond to ads emphasizing risk aversion. Okay, you want to know how they figured this out? Please, enlighten Uh, us. Okay, so they did a couple of things. They used an online survey tool to recruit 145 owners of either a cat or a dog. They gave the participants an imaginary $2,000 and asked them to invest any portion of it in either a risky stock fund or a more conservative mutual fund. Dog owners were significantly more likely to invest in stocks and also put more money at risk than cat owners. 
Okay, that's one test they did. Now, this one is really, the second one's really interesting. Sky, yes. Well, because that, that one was dumb right off the bat because <laughs> it's imaginary it money. It's imaginary money. There's yeah, no real still, risk. Right. But there was a difference between dog owners and cat owners. Yeah. There was a difference. Okay. Uh, then they asked 225 people to view four print ads featuring either a cat or a dog. Woof. And then decide how to allocate a $2,000 investment, as in the previous study. They found that exposure to dogs, just visual exposure to dogs, led participants to be more likely to invest more money in stocks. Hmm? What do you say about that, okay. Sky? I have a theory. I oh, think okay. I think that dogs are just friendly and emotive, and uh -huh. it makes people feel... Uh, welcomed and trusted. It it, it builds those good, uh, empathetic kind of mm -hmm. um, dopamine like pathways in the brain that just make you happy. And the so when you're a, happy, the world and, is a friendly place. Exactly, the world's a mm -hmm. friendly place. So why wouldn't I invest in something risky? Because what could possibly go wrong? Because you know everyone's Cause, happy. Where because my dogs are sinister me. and mean and and threatening, and yeah. so you want to be more protective. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Christian, have you ever owned a cat? I have actually, and I my son owns two cats right now, and oh. I ask him to FaceTime me all the time just to watch his cats, which is a weird thing. I grant, I can't explain it, but to they watch make them me happy. what? What to watch them what? Well, he has them chase a laser pointer, which is really oh, funny. Oh yeah, that's fun for the whole family. That yeah. was fun, and then you know he put a, he'll put a treat at the end to give them the little reward. Okay, uh, and. And then I watched them, you know, chase each other around the house. So I Exciting. don't know. It's cute. Would you say that's your your most risk averse son or your most risk taking son? Well, considering that he's in flight school to become a jet pilot. Hmm. Okay, weirdly, I'm not sure though, that holds yeah, up. he does like to be conservative, but yet at the same time, he does like risky activities. Like so, he has a motorcycle, hmm. likes to fly jets. Okay, I, I'm glad you bring that up, Christian, because I think that it also points out an inherent contradiction in this study. Uh -oh. Because if cat owners are supposed to be more risk averse, I would argue that owning a cat in and of itself is an incredibly <laughs> risky endeavor. Because right. those spot on. those hairy little friggers would murder us if they That's had true. the chance. But how That's many true. people have been murdered by their house cats? Probably Just because they than would, dogs. they don't. Well, it depends you, on if their house cats cat was kill a more tiger. people than dogs. Dogs kill more people than cats every year in America. Wow, they many didn't more mean people. To. Another I've study, and that, then they did one more study. Another study recruited 283 undergrads and asked them to recall a past experience involving a cat or a dog. Remember an interaction with a cat or a dog. Then they randomly read an ad for a massage business. That either emphasized how massages increase metabolism, boost immunity, and rejuvenate the body, messages psycho psychologists have found appeal to people seeking rewards, or how they soothe body aches, relieve tension, and reduce stress. Phrases that tend to work better on cautious people. Students who recalled an interaction with a dog offered bids significantly higher when they were exposed to the reward-oriented rather than risk aversion ads. In contrast, those who recalled a cat offered much higher bids for a massage when they saw ads focused on risk aversion. Ha 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 ha! What do you do with that one, Sky Jatani? I don't know. I just... I, it's fine. Whatever. I just... I, is there really that close a correlation between personality risk reward personality and cat and dog ownership they That's, just found it oh well okay they just well, and what do we well, do with this information how do exactly, we apply this my point like yeah why do we Depending, spend all this time and money oh 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 because if you are advertising a product that protects you that reduces risk insurance put a cat in it put a cat in the ad and if you're, ah, if so you this is are, marketing research. Yes, this is marketing research. If you're advertising, say, skydiving or bungee jumping, you want someone with a big, happy Labrador in the ad jumping out of the plane, and then everyone will do it because of dog. Dog. Okay. Second study. That was the first study. Second study. Drinking coffee before shopping could make you spend more. Oh, for Re sure. <laughs> why do you, why do you think that, that's a duh because why do you think they put coffee shops in every mall in america 
<laughs> drinking. Researchers found that those given caffeine in the range of 25 milligrams to 200 milligrams spent significantly more money and bought a higher number of items. Uh, the experiment found that caffeine also affects the types of purchases consumers make as those who drink regular coffee tended to buy more items meant for enjoyment. <laughs> Whereas decaf drinkers bought items intended for Pain? punishment. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they buy. Yeah, uh, I don't know. While moderate amounts of caffeine consumption have positive health benefits, there can be unintended negative financial consequences of caffeine intake. This Besides is like the money you spend on the coffee. Reason 300 to 300,012 that I don't drink coffee. Yeah, yeah. I drink coffee, but why well, drink coffee with chocolate in it? I don't know if that if that negates the impact of on spending because the chocolate makes me happy because I don't spend after I drink coffee. I Perfect. don't know. But whatever you do, do not tell my husband this study, because then he will probably forbid my coffee he'll cut, drinking. He'll cut your <laughs> cut you off. Oh, yes. he'll, he'll confiscate your Starbucks card. Wow. OK, the queen died. Did you hear about that? I did. Queen of I England. I was sad about that. Yeah, but she was old. You know, she but, had a, wouldn't you say she had a good run? I don't know. I was thinking there was something nefarious because like two days before she died, she had a I meeting. saw her in a picture yeah. with Liz Truss and she looked beautiful, happy. And two days later, she was gone. And so I wondered, mm -hmm. did Liz Truss have something on her hands and she wiped her nose and then the queen Foul was play. gone? Foul play. Putin. I'm just going to say Putin. Maybe. Uh, okay. Putin. She was 96 years old. I don't Putin. think it takes a lot. It's it's like, you know, somebody, a car teetering on the edge of a cliff, a slight shift in the balance of weight, and that thing's going over. Like, it doesn't take much to kill a 96-year-old. Yeah, but the whole, the whole empire was working to keep her alive, to make her eternal. And they almost succeeded. They were that make close her eternal. to creating the eternal queen. Anyway... Here's what I, I wanted to bring up, because she seemed to have a, a pretty strong personal faith, from what I understand, and came from an era where that was much more likely, you know, if she formed, kind of formed as an adult in the 50s um, and early 60s, she was more likely in, in England, in English culture, to have a strong attachment to the Church of England and, a, and an honest-to-goodness faith. Is, is she the last monarch that will have that kind of personal attachment to her faith and the notion of, you know, the defender of the faith, which is one of the titles of the king or queen of England, um, does that become a sillier and sillier notion going forward as, you know, even the royal... Uh, my assumption is the royal family is secularizing through generations. Look at Prince Andrew. I mean, come on. So... <laughs> well, hold on. J you... Mm. S sexual misconduct doesn't exactly only exist I, among non-believers. I don't think that's a value headlines. in the Church of England. No, of think, course not. But and it's, the mm. Queen, the Queen, she was straight as an arrow. Well, and I, I do think we need to be careful because it is impossible for us to judge from the outside what someone's internal faith might be. Well, then how are we supposed to have a podcast? <laughs> That's what we do is we judge from the outside. Um, okay, first of all, Phil, I think the yeah. whole, the title Defender of the Faith is kind of, I mean, I'm not Anglican, so I guess I'm throwing stones here, but it's kind of yeah. ridiculous to begin with when you know its origin. Defender of the Faith. What's its origin? So the Pope gave from that title to Henry VIII when Henry VIII wrote a paper to discredit Martin Luther. Of course, Martin Luther nails oh. his 95 theses on the door at Wittenberg, kind of launches the Protestant Reformation as we commonly date it. Uh, the church, Roman Catholic Church at the time, is super, super upset about it. Henry VIII, who's still a good Roman Catholic, goes, this Martin Luther needs to be put in his place. And he wrote this whole thing debunking Luther. And the Pope rewarded Henry VIII by saying, you are the defender of the faith because you are attacking this crazy Protestant. Of course, it wasn't much longer that Henry VIII broke from the Pope because he refused yeah. to give him an annulment, and that well, whole marriage the, divorce situation Pope, led to the Church of England. Didn't and then, the Pope then take back the title? You are no longer. Was yeah, he French well, at the time? I, I think the, he should have been French. You are no longer the defender of the faith. The Pope I eventually, in, 
he eventually excommunicated. I think it was Elizabeth yeah. I, or one of Henry's daughters was excommunicated because they left the Roman Catholic Church. So you're yeah. given this title by a pope that you don't even agree with anymore for uh-huh. for attacking somebody that you now agree with. So the uh-huh. whole origin of the title is kind of silly, if you understand it. But it's I tradition. I see your point. You know? I see your point. So then who's going to well be made. the defender of the faith? I, I think, like hmm? I've said before, I think God's Justin pretty good at defending Brierly? himself. Okay. <laughs> uh, but your point is still valid, and there's been quite a bit written about this, which is the Queen did have, for all, uh, from all appearances, a very sincere and devout faith, and she was quite open about it. And her successor, Charles III, uh, a little different, like far more... Who knows? Who knows? Uh, uh, well, he's been he's been open about it, and he he says he has rooted his own faith in the Church of England, but he's far more uh, spiritual, but not religious. I guess would be the phrase to use. Mm-hmm. And he's talking about how back twenty some years ago, he said rather than defender of the faith, he prefers to think of himself as defender of faith, faith mm-hmm. in general. To, to make yeah, I, I read yeah. a piece that talked about his commitment to defending the right of everyone in in the British commonwealth to practice their own faith and to be fair his mother did that as well in fact she she navigated some pretty tricky waters over her reign where you know the great britain has a and the english empire in general has a very convoluted history between protestants and catholics Mm -hmm. wars and weird stuff going on and then of course northern ireland and all the conflicts there between protestants and catholics and early on in her reign, she met with the Pope back in the 1950s, and she's continued to meet with different popes. She has she was the first British monarch to enter a mosque. She was the first British monarch to go to Ireland during mm-hmm. her reign. So mm-hmm. she made a lot of, of, of what would have been considered very scandalous and unpopular olive mm-hmm. branches towards non-Protestants, non-Anglicans in her reign. She was because also, she recognized that's where the empire was going, and that's the reality of the world. And now Charles seems to be just taking that to the next step with yeah. a lot of Muslims in England, a lot of Hindus, a lot of people of, of no faith, and he's just going, yeah, okay, it's all good. Yeah. Do you think she was the only thing holding England from sliding headlong into atheism? through her no. Through her force of personality? No. A- and now it's all over, and they're going to... They're going to shut down Justin Brierley and his show and put John Lennox in jail, and that'll be the end. <laughs> that, is that where we're headed? I don't think so. Yeah, I'm not Wright. English. I don't have my Get out of there, the N.T. Wright! Get out of there while there's still time! <laughs> They're coming for you! Okay. I think it'll be interesting to watch, because you've had just the same person in the chair forever, for as long as anyone alive can remember. There's one guy that was alive before she was in the chair, but he can't remember anything at all. He can't remember last Tuesday. So she's gone. It'll be interesting. Don't you think it'll be interesting to watch how the, how the transition, how it affects culture? If it affects culture, maybe it's irrelevant. Christian? I don't think it's irrelevant. I agree with you. I think it will be interesting. Yeah. What's unique about her is that we built a relationship with her. The world built a relationship with her, really based on her ascension to the throne, you know, mm-hmm. during a very turbulent time in history. Yeah. She was young. The world was, uh, you know, upside down. There was just chaos when she came to power. And she was a stabilizing force. And she really tried to be a good queen mm-hmm. on many different levels. And now we have this strange relationship with Charles as we've watched him kind of go through his life. And he comes to his, you know, throne with very different – I mean, people have very strong ideas or feelings about him. Right. And so right. his mandate to lead is very different, I think, than hers. And the question is, how is the world going to react? How is Charles going to react? How are his kids going to react? Right. We don't know. Remains to be I seen. I can make one prediction with a fair amount of confidence. Okay. What's are that? you ready for this? His reign will not be as long as his mother's. <laughs> I, there you go. I think that I think it, you're safe. Mark here's what's words. weird, though. It could be more consequential. <gasps> Why? What's it? What's he gonna do if it's the last one? Oh, I just think you know what. But does everybody wants everybody wants um what's his what's his the older son William William, uh, Henry, William. yeah everyone wants William to be king so I that don't... what's her face can be the queen because they know how to do it right not like Harry and Meghan or all the others. 
Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna annoy or offend the the pro why? monarchy folks in England. Why that why do you gotta do that? Guy? But it's like why? Okay, it's the world's most expensive tourist attraction. Why not just get rid of the monarchy and put up a really good theme park? <sighs> theme parks are less scandalous. They don't kind of you know they don't get into all this conspiracy theories. You they know, don't run around with Jeffrey Epstein. You, you know, know what? The th- here's the thing. Oh, we wouldn't thing. go into Europe and wipe out all of the big cathedrals and the yeah, castles Sky. and all of that. Because why would you do that, Sky? Why would I'm you not do that? Get rid of any of the architecture. I think it's great. <laughs> yes, but the the monarchy is like architecture. Don't it, it, mess with other people's tradition. Yeah, I'm not. I'm just That's... giving them ideas. I I thought Queen Elizabeth was an admirable monarch and, okay. and an, a, a phenomenal figure, and she kind of defined a lot of the 20th century for the the yep. waning era of the British Empire, and she did it gracefully and and with dignity, and everyone adored her for that. But her progeny, eh, yeah, you know, the progeny it's a little bit is harder to hold progeny up the, is questionable, right? But you know, we also thought that. Zelensky over in Ukraine was just an actor, and why would he need to be, you know, yeah. how could he ever be a leader? Yeah. And really, the times have made the man. Exactly, so, Sky. Listen to Christian. We have no idea, no idea what the times are going to do to Charles or to no William idea. after him. We shall see. We shall see. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. okay. I mean, it's happy. It's not my problem. It's there. They're welcome to do what they want. I'm just saying. It seems like it's a lot of trouble lately. I'm trying it's to. It's also end, a lot of money, for sure. I'm trying yeah. to end. I'm trying to end this conversation. I'm trying to. We're just. I'm moving. <laughs> so stop. You can off. Take it offline. You can continue talking about the pros and cons of the monarchy, figurative or otherwise. I'm moving on. We've talked a lot about evangelicals. I don't know if you've noticed that over the years. We talk a lot about evangelicals. We consider them our own tribe, and we've talked a lot about the the polarization and the splits between evangelicalism. So we're not going to talk about that today. Instead, we're going to talk about the Catholic Church. Uh, The U.S. Catholic bishops have just filed a report to the Vatican after extensive internal surveys and listening sessions within dioceses all across America. They compiled a huge report, like 250 different reports compiled into one. They gave it to the Vatican, and the report shows that the church in America has been split by politics. That's the result of the church. Catholics in the United States are deeply divided over issues as disparate as LGBTQ inclusion, clerical sex abuse, uh, and different ways of celebrating the liturgy, according to a summary of consultations carried out in dioceses across the country in recent months as part of Pope Francis' program. You're ready for the name of this program? It has Is this it in very... Latin? No, it's not in Latin. It should oh. be, but it's not. No, because he, he banned the Latin Mass, so he's Mr. Anti-Latin. He didn't ban it. He, well, he, he tightened the restrictions against doing the Latin Mass. That's one of mm. the reasons people are mad at him. Um, it's called the Synod of Synodality. The Synod of Synodality, which is I kind of like synod. the committee about committees or the meeting about meetings. It's meta. The Very. Synod on Synodality. Participants felt this division within the church as a profound sense of pain and anxiety. Um, a controversy about whether Catholic pro-choice politicians, including President Joe Biden, should be allowed to receive communion at Mass has fractured Catholic communities in recent years. Different views on the Eucharist and the celebration of Mass. The polarization has affected the church hierarchy with the divisions among bishops and sometimes between bishops and the Pope becoming, quote, a source of grave scandal. And this perceived lack of unity within the hierarchy seems to, in turn, justify division at the local level. Catholics reported that they were concerned about uh, polarization and also about marginalization, emphasizing calls by many Catholics for the church to become a more welcoming and open space. Two groups most marginalized, it suggested, were those who lack social or economic power and those whose lifestyle is condemned by church teaching. Also, the role of women in the church is controversial, with many Catholics wanting women to have a greater involvement, greater decision-making roles, and leadership roles. Okay, yes, other, okay. other than the very top of that list, which was about giving communion to politicians who are pro-choice, yeah, the rest of it didn't sound particularly political. LGBTQ? Again, that's not necessarily political. That's, that's Decision theological making for leadership? and ecclesia. What's that? Decision-making for women in leadership? 
it's not politics. Like every, that's 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 yeah, just everything is church. politics. Exactly. But like when I think of politics, I think of conservatives and liberals, Republicans and Democrats. Well, yeah. That kind mm-hmm. of stuff. And yes, okay. these things do collate around those things. But the discussion about whether or not women should have more role of leadership in the church. I mean, mm-hmm. there's churches that have been arguing about that for decades and all kinds of different backgrounds. It has nothing to do necessarily with politics. Well, actually, Sky. It is Christian politics. It is church mm-hmm. politics. It's church. It's it church may not polity. Be national it's politics. Polity. Right. 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 I'm thinking of government politics. Okay. So, do you think that? Because my my initial reaction to this was, they're they're having the same struggles that we're having. Do you see it as similar, or do you see it as different and somehow more solely church related and less? Because the one mm-hmm. thing you don't see typically in Catholic. You know, the Catholic Church in America is we have to take back America because there's no sense that the Catholic Church was ever running America in any legitimate sense and was more likely being uh, discriminated against by people in power in America. So you don't see that we have to make America Catholic again. That's not a thing. So, But other than that, do you see this as radically different than what's happening in evangelicalism? No, because they're all we're all swimming in the same culture, right? Uh, so we're all picking up mm-hmm. the same... Okay, you know, currents and trends and and arguments, and we're bringing them into the communities that we're a part of, including the church. Mm-hmm. Okay, so do you think the, the, our Catholic brothers and sisters can learn anything from us, or can we learn anything from them in this scenario? Is there uh, a way we can look to each other and help each other wade these fraught waters of polarization? Well, in general, the history of the Catholic Church. And where it differs from the Protestant church is when Protestants have disagreements, they tend to have schisms. They they break yeah. away and they go, yeah. we're done we, with you. We split. We split. A, a we go pox on your that, house. We're the right, true that's Presbyterians. Why there's like thousands of Protestant churches and denominations. Whereas yeah. Catholics, they have factions and they have, but they, mm-hmm. they believe in one holy Catholic church. And so you can't really break away without giving right. up everything. So they tend right. to stick it out despite having factions and fights and all that. So, yeah, there's something to learn there. What? What What? What? what did we just learn from what the, you just said? That well, we should just Catholic, stick it out? The, the Catholic emphasis on ultimate church unity is something that Protestants need to struggle more with. But they don't make, have a choice. Uh, you can't split. <laughs> you could leave. You can leave. Yes, but, and, and a lot yeah. of... Yeah, the, the one concern raised by a lot of people in these listening sessions was how many young people were leaving because of the church's positions on or, or lack of welcoming to LGBTQ uh, people. Yeah, but that's also the other thing about, I mean, the word Catholic means universal. Uh-huh. And when you're just talking about the American Catholic Church and its particular issues, it's a global church. And there are many parts of the world that these things are not controversial the way they yeah. are in Western okay. Europe or North America or Australia. So, you know, if you're sitting in Rome in some really high position like the Pope, mm-hmm. you have to consider, like, For it's example. not just, it's not what a bunch of cranky 25 year old Americans are saying about the Catholic Church. It's probably occupying most of your attention. Mm-hmm. You don't think so? Mm-mm. Okay. Well, he went all the way to Canada because some Canadians were cranky. Well, I'm not saying he doesn't care about what's going on throughout the church, but it's a very big, diverse church. And so no one group is going to have, you know, that much sway. Yeah. Christian, what can we, what what do you think we can learn? from? Well, I do agree with Sky. I think it is fascinating, the difference between the history of the Catholic church and its unity versus what happens in the Protestant church. I think we can all learn from each other by listening and by watching what other people do. So your initial question was, what can they learn from us and mm-hmm. what can we learn from them? And I think we have a lot to learn from each other. Yeah, I, I do think there's a huge distinction in in the sense of a glorified past, you know, because in, in the 1920s, one of the reasons the KKK sprung back to life was the influx of Catholic immigrants. And it wasn't just about African-Americans, it was also about Jews and Catholics coming to America from Eastern Europe, from Southern Europe, from Ireland in droves, and affecting what America was supposed to be. So Catholics were once like the illegal immigrants from across the border, where politicians were saying, they're coming and they're ruining America. So you don't, they, they do have the benefit of never 
being under the delusion that America was supposed to be exactly their strain of Christianity. And many of us seem to have that belief. Yeah, so there. 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 Okay, okay. I'm avoiding talking about evangelicals this week, and I'm avoiding talking about uh, Republicans. A few people complained. Too much talking about Republicans and evangelicals. I'm saying, okay, I'm just going we're just, we're just not going to do that this week. Give that a do rest. It. I have something well, else to talk, talk about. about could we talk about liberals and the black church in America? I don't know. I don't, um, no, I don't, I don't that's have, not okay. That's off the table. Of, I don't have a lot of information. I don't have, it's not my tradition. An expanded safety net drives sharp drop in child poverty with little public notice and accelerating speed. This is some good news, everybody. I got some good news. Here's some good news. Are you ready for this? Child poverty has fallen by 59% since 1993 in America. Is that because there's fewer kids? <laughs> no. Wait, okay. You're so cynical. No, as a percentage. I, I don't. Mm. What? No. Stop it. Um, for a generation or more, America's high levels of child poverty set it apart from other rich nations. Amid mounting evidence that early hardship leaves children poorer, sicker, and less educated for the rest of their lives. But with little public notice and accelerating speed, America's children have become much less poor. Comprehensive new analysis shows that child poverty has fallen 59% since 1993, has fallen in every state, has fallen by about the same degree among children who are white, black, Hispanic, and Asian, who are living with one parent or two, and in native or immigrant households. In 1993, nearly 28% of American children were poor, meaning their households lacked the income the government deemed necessary to meet basic needs. By 2019, before temporary pandemic aid drove it even lower, child poverty had fallen to about 11%. So 28% down to 11%. And uh, obviously That's the big question great. is, why? What, what do they yes. attribute it to? Yes, well, you might not believe this, but liberals... And, and conservatives disagree about why this has happened. I'm shocked. <laughs> thought we weren't going to talk about those. Uh, no, I said Republicans. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's different, Christian, clearly. That's different. Clearly. Okay, so, uh, so a couple big things. In 1993, there was a large expansion of the earned income tax credit for low-wage workers. Okay, that started a, de a decline. It put a little more money into the pockets of working families. Uh, but in 1996, President Clinton revised the welfare program and removed just straight cash welfare. It was at the time they said it's the end of welfare as we know it, uh, because they put in work requirements. If you weren't working, you can't get welfare. That drove a lot of single moms into the workforce who had prior uh, been able to get welfare without going into the workforce. So conservatives will often point to the that and say that's what lowered child poverty. It's forcing single moms to go to work. Um, but then in, two, in uh, 2008, uh, there was more safety net from the expansion of the earned income credit. So when the Great Recession happened, it did not have a, a create a major increase in child poverty. 2017, there was an expansion of child tax credits for low income families. So it increased even more. There have also been increases in SNAP, um, in food stamps, and a couple other increases. So starting in the 1990s, tough welfare laws shrank cash aid to parents without jobs. But other subsidies grew, especially for working families, and total federal spending on low-income children roughly doubled. The analysis found that multiple forces reduced child poverty, including lower unemployment, increased labor force participation among single mothers, and the growth of state-level minimum wages. But a dominant factor was actually the expansion of government aid. Hang on, I'm going I'm fast forwarding. Well, and I would think that things like school meals, like they started doing breakfasts, yep. lunches, afternoon snacks at a much larger level than ever had been previously done. Yep, so yep, that yep, had yep. To help. So we have, we have, so there's a whole patchwork of programs and they say that there was no real oversight, like strategy for all the programs. There was just one administration started this over here and Congress in another year started this over here and it wasn't coordinated. 
but the result has been a dramatic reduction in child poverty. So a patchwork of programs shaped by a century of political conflict and compromise, the safety net bears the imprint of both parties and commands the satisfaction of neither. Most Republicans want less spending, more local control, and more rules requiring work. Most Democrats want higher spending for more people, um, as seen in their unsuccessful bid this year to permanently turn the child tax credit into a broader income guarantee. Yet whatever its flaws... The safety net uh, lifts a record share of children from poverty. uh, President Ronald Reagan said a generation ago, the federal government declared war on poverty and poverty won. But with child poverty at a record low, that narrative of defeat appears to be obsolete. Hmm. That's the conclusion of the study, that we actually did lift children out of poverty. Um, About a third of it, they said, was because of the work requirement and how many single moms joined the workforce, but the rest, um, and the, someone is about just low unemployment, you know, and the, the booming economies that we've had since then. Um, but the biggest chunk of it was actually government aid, increased government aid. So a safety net that li- lifted kids out of poverty. So what, what was the source of the study again? The source of the study was some people who did a study. Um, I don't know. It was printed in the New York Times. Well, the reason, well, that tells you at least a little bit. The, um, those three factors, reforming welfare, uh, a widening social safety net, but then the general growth of the economy overall and low unemployment shows that there's no one single silver bullet solution here. That This is true. You could have a, a widening social safety net, but if the economy is stagnant or declining or in recession you're going to have more poverty. Likewise, you could have a booming economy, but if you don't have an adequate social safety net, then there's going to be people who can't benefit from that economy and still need government assistance. So each side wants to say it's just one thing. And it's always more complicated than that. It's always more complicated than that. But the report, for example, you know, when we were talking about race, um, a lot of people said, you know, you don't want government programs because government programs made African-Americans poorer. You know, the, the uh, Johnson's war on poverty made more poverty. And that's what Ronald Reagan was saying, that, that the government declared war on poverty and poverty won. Reality is there are half as many African-American kids in poverty today as there were in 1963. Half as many. So it's really hard to argue that none of that stuff worked right when you look at the actual data wasn't it barack obama who used to say it's not about big government or small government it's about smart government he might have been the one i I think it was something like that but i mean we all know examples of ridiculous government waste and Mm -hmm. places where it needs to be trimmed or, or tightened up but there are also significant programs throughout our history that the government has implemented that have been brilliant that were not without flaw but generally really really positive And this is one of the things that I don't understand about the anti-government rhetoric is some anti-government people are 100% anti-government until it comes to the military. And then they're 100% pro-government. That's not government. That's the military. Yeah, exactly. The military is the biggest single part of the federal government. And so it seems like each side wants to pick and choose which parts of government they really like and which ones they don't. And in general, we just need really smart, wise, gifted leaders in government to make it work better for everyone. Right. Right. Christian, do you have any thoughts? Well, I mean, I was just thinking about not only, you know, to your point, Sky, um, you know, my father, who is typically, and I hate to always talk about my dad, but I mean, it's the one thing that I am like engrossed in at the moment. But, you know, he's very much against federal government, very much against big government. He worked for Ronald Reagan. What? He worked for Ronald Reagan. I know. I know. But now at 80 years old. He talks a lot about his Social Security and his civil (laughs) service pension and his Medicare and, you know, all of these things that he relies on and is now so incredibly thankful that they're there. You know, to your point, it just depends on where you're standing and at what time. Yeah. So so we've got – I wanted a week of good news. So here's the good news. You now know that if you see a dog in an ad – they're trying to get you to take a risk. So just be careful. Be a little cat-like. And if you see a cat in an ad, they're trying to get you to be cautious. So go the other way. Think a little dog-like. Okay, we learned something there. Don't drink coffee before you go shopping. And you'll be able to save money. 
Okay, we learned something there. Uh, we're uh, queen. We're we're not quite sure what to do. Where 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 Britain is headed, but we're going to keep an eye on it. So I don't know. Good news, bad news. I'm not sure. We'll see. Um, but we're helping kids out of poverty in America. We're helping kids out of poverty in America. We're doing a good job. It's actually things that we're doing together, all together, which is what we call governing, is working in some cases. So that's encouraging, isn't it? It is. I feel so uplifted, Phil. Aren't you feeling a little happier today, Scott? Yeah, and, sort of, and knowing that the Catholics kind of are podcast. having as many problems as we yeah, are oh, makes yeah, I me forgot feel about so that. great. And the Catholics are having problems just like we are, except they don't <laughs> think America was supposed to belong to them. That's the one advantage they have over us. God bless them. Okay. We can share. Can we share America with the Catholics? Do you think we can do that? Definitely. They can have Maryland. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Do we have a guest today, Sky? We definitely do. And he's, he's kind of between Catholic and Protestant. He's an Anglican. Oh, wow. So he's loyal to the queen who died. So he's loyal to Charles, Charles now, who doesn't even care. Yeah, I guess so. Okay. You'll, did you ask him about that? His loyalty no. to Charles? The not defender of the faith? <laughs> no, I did not. Okay. Right. Should have. Well, well, maybe next time. Mm -hmm. All right, y'all, thanks for supporting us on Patreon. Thanks for coming back for more. We'll keep, we'll keep making the sausage if you keep eating it. Bye! Bye, everybody. Without doubt, one of the themes that dominates our podcast is the struggles of the evangelical church in America. And I'd put those struggles into sort of three general categories. First, there's the struggles that are caused by leaders that are just toxic and implode. Second, there's the pressure that comes from a wildly post-Christian culture and all the new challenges that it brings. And then finally, there's just personal burnout and deconstruction, that sense of our own faith being weak and fragile and kind of tearing it all down. How are we supposed to respond to those three challenges? Now, to be fair, there is no magic silver bullet solution that's going to solve all of them. But I do believe there is something from Christian tradition that is largely underutilized, which could at least mitigate these three challenges. And that's what my guest today, Aaron Damiani, writes about in his new book, Earth Filled with Heaven, Finding Life in Liturgy, Sacraments, and Other Ancient Practices of the Church. Aaron is the lead pastor of Emanuel Anglican Church in Chicago. And as an Anglican, you'd expect that he would advocate for liturgy and church tradition. But that's not what his background is. He comes from that low church evangelical background, which is all about the preacher and missional effectiveness and megachurch. But he burned out on that at a young age and realized it wasn't healthy for his soul, either as a leader or as a Christian. And he found that so much of the emotionalism that drives a lot of contemporary Christianity leaves us hungry, it leaves us anemic, it leaves us unable to weather the storms of a diverse culture and the challenges our faith is facing today. Whereas the rhythms of liturgy, the stability of it, the holistic nature of it that engages our bodies, not just our emotions, can better equip us to live faithfully in this tumultuous culture. As you're sure to pick up from our conversation, Aaron is really written for an audience that is not comfortable or familiar with liturgy, but he wants to welcome you in to explore it. And he stuck around to do a bonus interview with me that will be exclusive for our Patreon supporters about the issue of forgiveness and what he's teaching right now in his church that he's learned from studying Desmond Tutu and what he did with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa. It's such a great conversation. I was actually tempted to make it the lead interview rather than just a bonus segment, but Aaron's book on liturgy is also so good and so helpful that we went with that. But anyway, if you're not a Patreon supporter, you are really missing out. So definitely sign up, go to holypost.com and click the support us button. Okay, here is my conversation with Aaron Damiani. Aaron Damiani, welcome to the Holy Post. Thanks for having me, Sky. Yeah, you're you're here in Chicago with me. We bump into each other from time to time, but it's been a while. Congratulations on the new book. Thank it's you very much. Second book? Yes. Well, this one is called Earth Filled with Heaven: Finding Life in Liturgy, Sacraments, and Other Ancient Practices of the Church. Um, the reason why this is interesting, partly, is because it's coming out of Moody, Moody Press, yes. Moody Publishers, and Moody is not particularly known for its liturgy and sacramental tradition. Uh, you are a graduate of Moody Bible College, Bible Institute. Let's start with your story. How did you go from Moody Bible student to Anglican priest and author of book on sacraments and liturgy? Because that sounds like an interesting journey, which you do talk about in the early chapters of the book. So kind of fill us in a little. 
you know, it started with a really great freshman year followed by a crash and burn sophomore and junior year for me. I went from, you know, high flying evangelical Christian student involved in everything and loving it and really growing. Actually, it was a it was a wonderful time. But then I hit this point where just beginning with a close friend's father who took his own life, which was really confusing for me and left me grieving along with other relational fallout. And then there was uh, just in my own studies, I was beginning to really get confused, doubting my faith with what do I believe is true about Jesus, the Bible? How do I reconcile what I'm learning with my with my prayer life, with my faith, with my worship? And then finally, I was in my first leadership assignment and I burned out of that assignment. And so I was left going, how do I connect with God when I can't feel my way to God? I can't think my way to God and I can't serve and lead my way to God. You know, how do you how do you connect with the Lord when you're hungry for God, but you're grieving, you're doubting and you need a break? I didn't have a model for that. And so right around that time, my friend uh, Phil invited me to a Presbyterian church in the city. And this church was a gospel church. They preached the scriptures, but they featured the sacraments and they featured liturgy. And it was for me an experience of experiencing the church of a, like a mother where you're invited in. You're not actually expected to, to perform, to have big emotional experiences, to have all kinds of confidence about what you believe or to immediately get plugged in and take on, you know, the load of, of ministry all of which are, are fine and good things. But what I needed was that easy yoke that Jesus talked about. And I experienced his easy yoke through the ancient practices of the church that was carried out by a normal, you know, imperfect local church that was ready to pass things on for weary spiritual travelers like me. Describe your church experience before that. What kind of churches had you been a part of, whether when you were a student or even growing up? Yeah. So the church immediately before this was a mega church and it was my first mega church experience it was it was quite exciting you always remember your first <laughs> you always remember your first it's true yeah and it was a bit of a roller coaster ride because it was i mean you would be ex you would be thrilled but also you would feel incredible guilt and then there would just be this excitement that what i'm a part of is a movement that's much larger than me and um is is has potential to to be even more and i'm you know, experiencing this in the early days, potentially. And so um, that was a, I think in that environment, I was uh, really in that place where I'm feeling those strong emotions. And I'm also just getting my uh, butt kicked from the in your face, expository preaching uh, that is bold, and it just doesn't hold, hold back. Uh, can, can I interrupt you here? Because I want to quote you to yourself in your book where you're talking about this experience in this mega church as a college student. Uh, you said, we carried this sense that our pastor would eventually get big and discovered, and then our church would get big and discovered. You don't kind of elaborate more on that, but there's implied there a certain ambition, not just on the part of the pastor, but on those following the pastor. Can you kind of unpack what what is it that drew you into that megachurch orbit that you think may draw other people? I think that for me, there was a desire for church to win and for it to be hmm. interesting. And it, there was something humble about the local church always. There's something misunderstood and, and uh, very down to earth about kind of your normal, imperfect local church. And so when I was part of this mega church, it just felt like it was booming. It felt like it was incredibly um, attractive and special, something you could easily invite your friends to, something that looked and felt impressive. And so when it looked and felt impressive, well, that made Jesus and the faith look and feel impressive. And like it, like it was winning, like it was not going to be uh, tackled by the, the cultural forces. And, and also there was some contempt they're looking down on Christians that are not this bold, not this big, not this yeah. growing. And that felt good, too. It's like, yeah, I don't want to be a part of that anymore. Something that's way too normal and strange and 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 backward and, you know, the, the carpet smelling a certain way and the choir dressing it. Anything old, anything. Um, I remember the pastor saying once, you know, people tell me we need more mystery around here. Stained glass windows and ancient things. And he said, scratch out the word ancient or scratch out the word mystery and put the word religion. 
And so hmm. there was a there there was a contempt as well towards the ancient church. And I remember I was at the point where something registered in me. This isn't right. Not all mystery is bad. Not all mystery is works righteousness. Not everything ancient should be looked down upon. At one point, again, early in the book, when you're kind of feeling that sense of burnout, you're you're on the, the treadmill to nowhere, as you put it. Um, you describe the way when, when you're having doubts, when you're not feeling close to God, when you're exhausted and stuff, the prescription that you had internalized was, well, then you just need to learn more and you need to do more. Yes. That that's sort of the evangelical solution to every spiritual problem or every emotional, relational problem. Just learn more, do more, learn more, do more. How have you seen that play out in your experience and those around you? Mm. I mean, it's everywhere. Whenever someone has a has an issue in their relationship with God, they're, they're, they're trying to get more books. You know, I think about people who are, uh, the, really their heart actually needs to be renewed. There's a uh, one of my friends refers to it as a it's a right brain spiritual formation um, moment where you actually need to experience the love of God, um, but in a way where you're not earning it. And but what many people do is they try to solve right brain problems in left brain ways where they're trying to uh, just accumulate theological knowledge or uh, relational life hacks, but that doesn't actually heal the problem of the heart. And this is where the body actually is neither learning more nor doing more, you're actually engaging in these ancient uh, rhythms and, and even rites that uh, go beyond, go deeper than words and feelings and thoughts, but actually bring a great integration between all of those things. All of those things matter to God. But if we're stuck in our heads with more theology or we're doing the manipulation, the manipulation of our emotions to feel a certain way or to maintain a certain yeah. high. I can only feel joy and happiness if I want to be close to God. And the truth is that we need the, to be able to bring our grief and lament as well. That doesn't feel as good. And that's also not as marketable. It's not as slick. It doesn't fit cleanly as much into a uh, worship service. So these are things that we, we struggle with in the modern evangelical church. I've wondered for a while, like when you look at church, popular church architecture and popular church worship services, when I say popular, I mean what dominates a lot of white evangelical Christianity. Um, these rooms that we enter into for worship tend to be getting bigger and bigger and darker and darker, right? They're, they're, there's no windows. They're, they're more or less boxes and the, the theatrical lighting that, illuminates the stage. And then the music over the course of my life anyway, feels like it's just gotten louder and louder and louder mm -hmm. to the point where you rarely can even hear yourself, let alone the people around you singing. All you hear is the amplified noise coming from the platform. And I've wondered if part of the reason for that is people are so disconnected with their own feelings and their yes. own communion with God that they come into these spaces and they need to be overwhelmed with feeling something that's produced from the platform. Yes. And it's, it's not the way worship used to be where a community would come together and express joy or lament or doubt or sorrow, whatever it might be. People could come into that room and have all kinds of garbage in their lives and you'd never know it because it's overwhelmed with this avalanche of joyful praise from the platform and everything else is drowned out. Um, Okay, so you, you, you went from that world into this Presbyterian church where you were introduced to liturgy and sacrament. Um, it was probably foreign to you at that point. What, when did you begin to learn what liturgy and sacrament really were versus what you had assumed they were when you first came? This particular thing was, for me, learning by experience, learning by doing it. There's a, there's a phrase that Anglicans refer to of, as you pray, so you believe. And for me, what was happening was as I engaged in liturgy and sacraments, I was learning about them, but then the, the learning followed up from that as well. And also it helped that I, I had some great church history professors at Moody. And so they were catching me up on the Reformation and the early church. And so that was filling in some of the blanks as well. So for me, it was actually important to experience the grace of those things for where there was a lot of space made for me to... Uh, to bring, you know, doubts and grieving, but then to learn that the sacraments and liturgy are not works righteousness. That was the crazy thing for me was that 
you know, they had been in some ways presented as these are just empty rituals, religion, mystery, right. um, that just, you know, burden the people who need grace. I was experiencing the opposite, which was actually, this is, this is grace incarnate. This is, this is an ability for me to participate in grace because there's uh, just a way for me to enter in with me being as messy as I am. And then to grow in Christ in a way that isn't forced and isn't produced. It, it feels like a lot of American evangelicalism legitimizes emotions as, as totally a great way to engage God. And even knowledge or intellect is okay, but our physical bodies, yes. those don't matter, which right. is very Gnostic. It's very uh, Platonistic and yes. dualistic. Yes. So what, what they dismiss as empty ritual, religion, all that. It's really just, we're using our bodies to actually perform things that are integrated. Um, give us a definition or your working definition of what do you mean by a sacrament? Yeah. A sacrament is a signpost of grace that you can't see yet. So I, a, I was on a bike trail recently, not too long ago, saw a deer a, a sign. It's just like, watch out for deer. And so I paid attention. I slowed down because even though I could not see deer there, deer existed in that area and it was important for me to pay attention. And so what sacraments do is they are a, they are a signpost of grace, the grace of God and Jesus Christ. Um, and so uh, this is a way that we actually can see not only Jesus Christ, but also our world as it was intended, not unlike those, uh, you know, corrective eyeglasses that help people who are colorblind see color for the first time. I don't know if you've ever seen someone who is colorblind put on those glasses and just, they just weep because they see this world is more beautiful than I ever knew. Yeah. So what sacraments do is they help us see in many cases that Jesus Christ has always been closer to us than we could ever feel or think or work our way to. And that's one of the reasons why they're so beautiful is how objectively good they are. And also the fact that they point us to the most true reality, which is the most beautiful reality behind our world. You have a whole chapters here on the sacrament of, of the Eucharist communion, the table baptism, but then you get into liturgy, which is sort of a broader category. And, and that's a word that freaks out a lot of low church Christians right? Mm -hmm. by low church. I mean, low liturgical, but how do you define liturgy and um, do you even low church, non -lit so-called liturgical churches have a liturgy? So yes, they do. Um, liturgy is very broad. It's the work of the people that works on the people. It's something that we do with our bodies that shapes our souls, whether checking the red, uh, you know, Facebook notification, on, uh, on our phones, swiping right on our phones or holding hands with our brothers and sisters in our small group and singing the Lord's prayer together. And so what, uh, ancient churches do, what, what liturgical churches do is they take the scriptures and they make liturgy out of them. And so that we're praying and singing and acting out the scriptures in a way where it gets in our bloodstream and it shapes our, shapes our community and it shapes our soul. The thing is though, that every church has some kind of way that they use right. the body to shape the soul. And it's just not called liturgy. And, uh, and that's okay. Not everyone has to use that word, but it is important to just acknowledge the human reality that we have a body and, and we need uh, to uh, use our body, engage our body in the path of salvation. So, yeah. What comes to my mind right now is uh, I have a son who's a senior in high school, and he is one of the 12th men, which is the group of guys. At, they're in the football games who kind of keep the, the stands all excited and hyped up. And there is a lot of liturgy around sports in this country, from yes. singing the national anthem at the beginning of a game to the chants, to the dress, to the the, the different procedures around these games. And and. and we don't think of it as a liturgy, but it is deeply formative Yes, as a community, as a school, as it, it forms us. We see these kinds of liturgies around patriotism. We see them around economics and shopping and all kinds of activities, but we don't, we tend to downplay its value when it comes to ironically faith, where it, it all came from. Um, in the book, in this chapter on liturgy, you talk about three misconceptions, which is a polite way of saying 
objections or just mistakes. So three misperceptions about liturgy, and then you give your responses to them. I want to kind of walk through those three. And part of what I didn't say yet, which is really important, what I, there's brilliant books out there about sacrament and liturgy, and some of them are on my shelf and written by brilliant theologians, not that you're not one of them. But what makes your book really super helpful is you very much have written it for an audience who doesn't have a background in liturgy, maybe skeptical toward it, and comes from that low church evangelical tradition like you came from. So you're writing to that person and helping them along here. And this chapter does it perhaps best. So the first misconception you list here is that liturgy is dead religion. Very common objection. How do you yes. respond to that? So my response is that liturgy actually makes us alive for the life and the calling God has for us. You look at the ancient church and they use liturgy to prepare for the great trials of their life. And back to your sports analogy, Sky, you know, the liturgies and the rhythms and the, and the patterns, the habits that are developed within a sports team prepare them for the game. And so when we're when we're at church together and when we are in or in our small group together, or even fixed our prayer just alone or with households, we are using these liturgies actually to uh, open our habits to the grace of God so that we can be alive for the calling that we have. And this is something that we do, like you said, in every arena of life. Um, this is not something that's actually going to dampen your love for God, even though it might feel boring sometimes. Boring isn't bad, as anybody training for anything can tell you. It actually is going to strengthen uh, the joy and the love that you have um, and, and give, give you the resources that you need to face the calling that God's given us. And, and that's the second misconception that you address here is that liturgy is boring. And I think that's yes. probably the one I have heard most frequently from people. Yes. It's yes. why would we do these things when it's rote and it's the same week after week and it's, um, it's just words on a page or on a screen and it's not heartfelt and sincere. It's boring. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do you respond mm -hmm. to that? Yes, my response to that is that actually liturgy is the best repository and strengthener of our joy. So uh, liturgy is something that brings together reverence and joy in a, in a, a really strong way. And so um, the, the fact that there's moments of silence, the fact that there's repetition, this might not feel pleasurable. This might not activate the amygdala. Uh, this, this might not feel authentic, but it is authentic. It's actually, we put way too much uh, stock in the feelings we have in the moment. And way too little uh, uh, stock in our ability actually to shape what we have joy in. So, you know, the way that um, uh, that I experienced this in Chicago is going to the Cubs game where I am invited to partake in the liturgy of singing Go Cubs Go when they win. <laughs> and I'll never forget doing that when they won the World Series and traipsing over to Wrigley Field. And I've, sang, I've sung that song many times when it was pretty, pretty normal and, and a, kind of an average day at Wrigley Field. All of that was actually in some ways preparing me for the moment when they had won the World Series. And that song, which had been, you know, inculcated in my system, came out in a burst of joy. It was the best thing that I knew how to do. And I think we've just got to ask ourselves the question, what are we preparing for? What are we preparing to rejoice in? Because if it's worth rejoicing in one moment, it's worth the... Uh, the training and the uh, boring parts before that. Uh, you gave a very uh, positive example there of, of joy erupting out of you in a liturgical way. Go Cubs go. Yes. The, the opposite that comes to my mind is, is a really painful story, well-known story about Todd Beamer, who was the Christian on flight 93 mm. on 9-11, who helped storm yes. the cockpit and prevented that plane from attacking another building. And the story goes that as he was on the air phone with, I think some flight control person, um, who was also a Christian, he recited the Lord's Prayer with her mm -hmm. before storming the cockpit, where that liturgical repetition of the Lord's Prayer was a way of stirring his courage yes. in what he knew was likely to be a you know really terrible event. So we can use we can our soul kind of returns to these patterns, both yes. to express joy and to cultivate faith and courage when they're challenged. Um Another example that comes to mind is years ago when I was a pastor at my church, which was a 
you know, kind of traditionally low church evangelical kind of setting, there was a season there where I was introducing some written prayers into the congregational kind of liturgy for our Sunday mornings. And one morning after the service, I was confronted by a woman who was quite upset with me in the church foyer. And she was kind of accusing me of introducing dead liturgy, right? This rote religion. And she was going off on me about how it's so inauthentic to just read a prayer up on a screen that someone else wrote. That's not spontaneous. It's not from my heart. And it's, you know, and she just had this disgust about the whole thing. And I, I have to confess that I got a little cheeky and snide. And I said to her, well, immediately before that prayer appeared on the screen, there were other words on the screen that you also recited. And she looked at me kind of confused. And I said, we sang a song before that prayer that someone else wrote. They were words that somebody else composed. The only difference was we put a melody to it. Mm. So how is that less inauthentic than the prayer that came after? Would you prefer we just put music to it and then would it be okay? And she kind of looked at me like, oh, I never thought about that before. Mm. Like we don't object to using someone else's words in song, but we object right. to someone else's words without the melody. Mm -hmm. Both are there to train us, to focus our attention on God and to, and to, to shape us. Okay. Last uh, misconception is that liturgy is strange. How do you yes. reply to that? Yeah. I think sometimes people experience liturgy, like going to your grandma's parlor room where it's just sort of smells weird. And it's just like completely not the place where you can relax and it's just disorienting. And so my response is that Liturgy is strange, but it's strange on purpose because it's giving us the song of heaven. And we're not in grandma's parlor room. We're going to the throne room of God. So liturgy at its best is shaped after the, the language of heaven where the cherubim and seraphim saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, where heaven and earth are actually reunited in Jesus Christ. And the saints and the angels and archangels are, are gathered around the throne. So that's going to be strange. I mean, I think about what's the moment going to be like when we're in heaven, when we are face to face with Jesus Christ. I think it's going to be incredible and beautiful. And, but I want to be ready for that day. I want to be prepared for that. And there's a strangeness that I expect. And so there's a strangeness that I'm tolerating and even embracing in embracing uh, biblical liturgy, because when we come into the presence of God, it's not supposed to be like everything else we experience in life. It's not supposed to be a casual workaday experience where it, it is humble, but it's not supposed to be something that is completely comfortable. Comfort and growth don't go well together. And so the strangeness of the liturgy is, is good. And the illustration I use there is if you're traveling to a foreign country that's beautiful and good and rich, um, you are going to experience a little bit of culture shock. But if you can't hang in there, the experience, the richness of that culture, of the people there uh, will, will deepen your life and it will get inside of you. And so uh, biblical liturgy is hopefully at its best doing that for us. But Aaron, Jesus is a white American from the 21st century who <laughs> supports the Second Amendment and the Constitution, oh, right? So what, well, there shouldn't be any foreign country analogy here. He's just right. like us. Right. Manifest destiny. Right. Um. One of the things that I think a lot of people have a growing sensitivity to is the damage that's being caused by the celebrity dynamic in a lot of the American church. Caitlin Beatty has been on recently to talk about her new book, Celebrities for Jesus. We've seen the flame out and just implosion of numerous well-known Christian leaders over the years, even not the well-known ones. We tend to focus so much of our churches around the teacher, the speaker, mm -hmm. the preacher, and Sometimes that can be life-giving and good when you have a very humble, godly person in that role, but they're all flawed, they're all sinful, and eventually problems arise. How does a renewed focus on sacrament and liturgy mitigate against some of that tendency? Yeah, it's important because the sacramental liturgical worship service is going to give ballast to what we are partaking in together. There's gonna to be less time for the sermon, uh, enough time to do its job because we're making space for the confession of the ancient creed, for the passing of the peace, and importantly, for 
the the Lord's table and some in some cases baptism. And so what these things and also the public reading of scripture, which is ironically the inheritance that evangelicals have lost. They were the ones who during the Reformation emphasized the scriptures need to be read in public worship settings. This is an ancient church practice going as far back as you can read about it in the pastoral epistles. Devote yourselves to the public reading of scripture. And yet we've lost it because we want to hear the comments about the scripture. And so what a liturgical church will do is provide, in many cases, a lectionary, a, a, a way to um, to follow the Old New Testament, the Psalms, the Gospels, and make sure that in, in most cases, at least uh, most of those are read every single time we gather for worship. And then what the sermon can do is it can complement what has already been uh, been put together, and it can get back to its role of being in tandem with the sacrament, word and sacrament, that is the ancient way. Yeah, er- earlier you defined a sacrament as a, a sign that makes us aware of an invisible, how'd you put it? Say it again. So I'll, I'll, I'll use the old St. Augustine definition. It is uh, an outward sign of an inward grace. Okay. Um, so. uh, the reason I bring it up again is because when I think about most of the churches I've been a part of, whether as a member or as a leader, Um, they would not call themselves sacramental. But as I look back on them, I'm going, they were immensely sacramental, very, very sacramental. sacramental. The difference is, and I've shared this before, maybe when I was talking about my book, we tend to view the pastor or preacher themselves as the sacrament. Yeah. That we think we will experience or get a glimpse of the character and nature of God through the personality of the person in the pulpit. Yeah. And that's really frightening. And that's partly Mm -hmm. why we've like, marginalized the table. We only do that Mm -hmm. once a month. Maybe we've marginalized Mm -hmm. the reading of scripture because we need to give as much time to the sacrament and the sacrament is not the sermon. It's the personality of the person presenting the sermon, Mm -hmm. man, that's dangerous and fragile and freaks me out. Now, when I, once I've, once I noticed that it it has changed my perspective on all this. Okay. Before we go though, I want to kind of challenge you on something. And that is, um, I know that there's been a lot of people who have like you and like me have come out of more low church evangelical kind of stuff who have been drawn more and more toward liturgy and sacrament for different reasons. But one of the reasons is just the novelty of it. Mm -hmm. So back in like the seventies and eighties, there were a lot of Americans who had grown up in, in stodgy mainline kind of churches and they were attracted to these new mega churches. Wow. You know, they're like, they use contemporary music and there's guitars and drums and there's a dynamic speaker and it's not all cymbals and smells and bells. And that drew a ton of people because of its novelty. Well, now we have multiple generations that have grown up in mega churches, have grown up in low church evangelicalism who are used to the, the preaching and the programming and all the, the happy, feel good, love songs to Jesus. And now they're kind of burned out on that and they're going, well, I want something different. Liturgy looks different. So how do we avoid this becoming just another consumer choice that's driven by mm-hmm. novelty and newness mm-hmm. rather than these deeper currents that you're talking about a formative mm-hmm. currents of liturgy. Yeah. You know, it, it makes me think actually of Dallas Willard where he talks about the difference between the vision and the means. So the vision of becoming like Christ is different than the means that we use to become like him. And so for liturgy, you know, I think it's important for us to get back to the vision what are we doing? Why are we doing this? Is it for the novelty? If novelty is the vision, it's going to wear out fast. Let me tell you, it's not going to be (laughs) something that you stick with if you're here for the novelty. But if you're here to grow in the grace of Jesus, and if you want to be prepared for the mission that he's he's given to, to all of us, liturgy can form you and the confession of sin for instance you can you can confess your own attraction to novelty and your own our own propensity to idolatry in the american church and but the vision is is greater than the means so um, we are we're looking to jesus and and his bride and and finding her beautiful again and that i think takes tremendous pressure off of the do more, learn more, get more novelty, get another high. We need to get off that treadmill in the American church. And so liturgy is not going to keep it, keep it moving. It's hopefully going to reorient us to a pattern of grace. That's ultimately going to be not just a rest for our souls, but good medicine for the, for the sick. Well, Aaron, thank you so much for this book. Um, Again, I recommend it, especially for those of you who have 
are unfamiliar with these traditions of the church and are curious about them. You've written it in a very accessible way, and you've given a lot of practical help here, too. If you're a church leader and you're thinking, I'd like to incorporate this more, but you know, people freak out about it or it strikes you as a barrier to newcomers, like it's not seeker sensitive. You even give advice here about how to really make these things hospitable and understandable for people who are new without losing their formative power. So it's a, it's just a great, helpful book. Again, it's called Earth Filled with Heaven, Finding Life in Liturgy, Sacraments, and Other Ancient Practices of the Church. Aaron, thanks so much for being here. Thank you so much, Sky, for having me on. It's been great. The Holy Post Podcast is a production of Holy Post Media. Production assistance by Julie Betcher. Editing by Jason Rugg. Help us create more thoughtful Christian media by supporting us at patreon.com forward slash holy post. Also, be sure to leave a review on iTunes so more people can discover thoughtful Christian commentary plus ukulele and occasional butt news. Visit HolyPost.com for show notes, news stories, Holy Post merchandise, and much more.